Welcome, class. It's always good to be able to present God's Word to you, to teach you. I appreciate your uh, comments. I appreciate your encouragement. Um, I miss getting together. Hopefully, um, it won't be long, but, uh, but there's no way of telling uh, when the timetable is going to be for us to get back together at this point. So, uh, welcome also those that are part of Parkview. I know there's a a uh, number that are watching that um, watch me faithfully every week that aren't part of my class. I appreciate that. Um, and welcome those also who are not part of our church family right here in Worcester at Parkview. And um, hopefully God's word is speaking to you each week and that um, you're getting um, encouragement and instruction from it. So uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to come before your throne and, and first, Lord, I want to just praise you for your great love, praise you for your compassion. Lord, we thank you for the love that you showed to us by sending us your Son and also by sending us your Spirit, Lord, to guide and direct those who wrote uh, the Scripture for us and also to guide us in our daily lives, and we praise you for that. Lord, we ask that you continue to be with those in the world that are affected by the virus and especially our healthcare workers and keep them safe. Pray that you will grant man wisdom as they're dealing with this. Pray that you continue to have your healing hand on those who have other issues, Lord, and, and that you will comfort those who need comfort. And Lord, I ask that you continue to guide us in being your hands and feet here on earth and ask that you can Continue to bless those who we support in the missions fields, Lord, around the world. And we ask and pray this in your son's name. Amen. All right. Uh, we are going to do Philemon today. And uh, Philemon is a little book, short little letter. Uh, it's right before Hebrews. It's after Timothy and Titus there in the New Testament. And... Um, Philemon is, was a slave owner, and he was in the city of Colossae. Uh, he was a prominent man there. Uh, the church met in his house. And, uh, and so this man was a Christian. He was converted by Paul, and he had a slave whose name was Onesimus. And Onesimus ran away. And as God's providence was, he ended up in Rome and he ended up in the house or area where Paul was being held. And Paul was able also to uh, convert Onesimus. So um, this letter is an intercessory letter between uh, Paul on the behalf of Onesimus and uh, and so it's a very interesting study on that. Uh, so here we have a slave who is a Christian now, and Paul has told him, you need to go back to your master. And we have a Christian who was the owner, and Paul is going to encourage him to accept him as a brother in Christ. So some really good concepts here. Um, before we start, I'm going to give you a little commentary on, on, on just a couple of issues here. Some Bible students wish that uh, Paul and the New Testament in general had more to say on the evils of slavery. And actually, it comments very little on the subject. Uh, perhaps the closest to criticism of slavery comes in Paul's reference to slave traders in 1 Timothy and he calls them man-stealers. Now, it seems that Paul didn't try to change society as much as it was to change individuals and to encourage them to apply Christian principles in every situation. And in that way, society would be changed. And that is truly the guiding principle of God's word throughout history, whether it's in Paul's time 
all the way up through uh, even to the unrest that we see in the world today and in our society today. The underlying principle should be that we should treat one another with love, with compassion, with support. Uh, we should treat one another as being uh, potentially brothers in Christ uh, and God's family together. Um, and if we apply these principles to any situation that comes up in society, I think society we would be better off. And so Paul chose to do it this way. And we'll see as we go through this letter here to Philemon, uh, Paul's effort and the way he was thinking. But I think it's a good guideline as we look at other things of unrest too in today. So we are ready for the first verse here. There's only one chapter in Philemon. So uh, it starts off with Paul, a prisoner of Christ. And so Paul, like I said, he was uh, in Rome. And he was under house arrest, so he was chained to a soldier uh, 24 hours a day. But he was able to receive people. People could come and go, and he could preach and teach. And we see a lot of this. And Paul wrote four books in this uh, first imprisonment at Rome. He was there for two years. We just did one, Ephesians. We're going to do the Philemon here now and then. Uh, Colossians and Philippians. So, uh, by the way, uh, Philemon was a citizen of Colossia. And so, uh, he, when he writes this letter, it's going to the Colossian people too, so to speak, as well as the book of Colossians. And that's what we're going to study next will be Colossians. But, uh, so, he starts off, he's a prisoner of Christ. Um, so I think he's already starting to appeal to Philemon's uh, sympathies. Uh, he's trying to soften Philemon up so that he will accept Onesimus back. Now, in this time, uh, someone who was a slave and ran away uh, was dealt with very harshly uh, when they were captured. And, and Paul is going to try to convince Philemon not to do this. So he continues, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. Now, Timothy's name is mentioned here in Philemon. It's also mentioned in Philippians and Colossians. So uh, Timothy was around and helpful to Paul when Paul was in prison in Rome his first time. And he emphasizes that he's their brother, um, Paul's a brother of Philemon. Timothy is the brother of Philemon. And Paul's going to use this same word here. Onesimus is now a brother because Onesimus is now a Christian of Philemon. So we go on here. It's addressed to Philemon. And all we really know about it, Philemon is what we see here in this little short uh, book or letter to him. And also he is mentioned in Colossians chapter 4. And we'll get to that as we study that. But we don't know too much uh, about him. But um, we do know he was a convert of Paul's. And so we'll see that here in a little bit too. So to Philemon, our beloved brother and fellow worker. So he's a brother. He's a Christian, a fellow uh, brother in Christ, and a fellow worker. So we know that his house was open for the people to meet at there um, in Colossia. And uh, also, uh, it looks like that he was active in supporting the work, uh, the furtherance of the gospel, if you will. Now, he goes on here in verse 2 to address um, an Alphia, our sister. This appears to be Philemon's wife. Uh, and then... Also, uh, Archippus is our fellow soldier. 
Archippus was, it appears to be the son of Philemon and Alphia. And, uh, and it appears that uh, Archippus is, uh, is maybe a preacher. Maybe he is the one that ministers or preaches there at the house church uh, at Philemon's house. And so he greets them and the church in your home. So this letter is written to Philemon. It's really a very personal letter written from Paul to Philemon about Onesimus. But at the same time, he's addressing these other people. So it's, Paul's expecting this letter, even though it's short and personal, to still be read to the church that attended at his house, the people that assembled at Philemon's house. So, verse 3. Um, these, this word says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, this greeting is identical to the greeting that Paul uses in six other epistles, six other letters. And it's Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, and Philippians. He starts off his letter with this same greeting. So, grace to you. And no doubt he's speaking of God's grace, God's wonderful riches that we have through Christ his Son. And his, God's infinite compassion on those uh, when he has forgiven their sins. God's infinite compassion on us when he has forgiven our sins. That is what is involved in God's grace and peace. And the only way we can be at peace with God is to have our sins forgiven, to have Christ as our intermediary between us and the Lord, and to be in harmony with what God wants for us. So grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 4, it says, I thank my God always making mention of you in my prayers. Um, after writing a uh, greeting, it was the custom of the first century letter to include an expression of thanksgiving. And Paul follows this custom in every letter he writes except for the book of Galatians. So you have your greeting and then you have a form uh, or a, a um, expression of thanksgiving. And it's interesting here, Paul goes to the uh, singular uh, pronoun I, because really this letter is personal between him and Philemon. And the, even though he knows, the, he greets the rest of the people because he knows that they're going to read this letter or see it, but this letter is really personal. So now from this point on, this letter is really uh, between him and Philemon. So I thank my God always. Uh, and making mention of you in my prayers. So he knows who Philemon is. He's glad that Philemon has stayed strong and that he's continuing to work for the assembly of people there in his house. He remembers him in his prayers, which is something that's so important. You know, we learned that last week at the end of Ephesians, how we should pray for one another is an important part of being a Christian. And Paul is just living it out here. <clears throat> Verse 5, he says, Because I hear of your love, um, and it, this word because, that's, he mentions him in his prayers because of the fact that he, he hears of your love and of the faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints. So uh, this word I hear is in the present tense, which means I keep hearing. So Paul is getting reports from his household here that he is continually hearing he's of his love for the Lord and toward all saints. So not only does Philemon uh, love the Lord and he's trying to work for the Lord, he loves all the Christians that are gathered there too. And this is going to be important because uh, Paul is going to Tell Philemon here in a minute, this slave that ran away from you, he is now a saint. He is now a Christian. 
and and Paul's just reminding and I, I keep hearing how you love uh, all the saints and now Onesimus is, is now one of those saints so so he's sort of building up to the theme of his letter here little by little it's interesting he doesn't mention Onesimus yet for a few more <laughs> a few more verses so now verse 6 and I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective through the knowledge of every good thing which is in you in Christ for Christ's sake. And so now he also prays that the fellowship of your faith may become effective. The Greek word for effective here uh, is, has a picture of a mill in working order where all the parts work together, work's being done, and he's saying, I want your faith to be effective. I want it to be maybe profitable. I want it to be uh, in good working order. Um, and so the faith he's talking about here, that the fellowship of your faith may become effective, faith is only effective when it's accompanied by deeds. Uh, it goes along with what we read in James um, where we're told that faith is dead if it has no works. And so Paul is praying for him for that. And that uh, through the knowledge of every good thing, that, uh, that he would develop a knowledge of every good thing that might need to be done, that it might, he might need to do, which is yours uh, for Christ's sake, which is literally means toward... Um, Toward Jesus Christ. So, verse 7 says, For I have come to have much joy and comfort in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. So he's continuing to tell Philemon of the, <clears throat> what Philemon's actions do for Paul personally. And he says, I've had much joy. Uh, because of the comfort and love that he has shown to the saints. Um, it's interesting that the word comfort here can also be translated encouragement. And you might think comfort and encouragement aren't too similar, but it literally means calling alongside off for the purpose of rendering some kind of assistance. So if you come alongside someone and you're offering your assistance, you can see how that would be both comfort to them because you're there and it would also be encouragement to them because you're there to help them. So, so he's saying he's got much joy uh, and comfort from the love that uh, Philemon has shown. And now we'll, we'll do the second part of this verse here. It says, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. I want to start by looking at the word refreshed here. Um, it's the same word that, that Jesus used in his promise in Matthew eleven twenty six, 26. In Matthew 11, chapter 11, verse 28. And he said, come to me, all you who are wearied, and burden, and I will give you rest. This word for rest is the same word that's translated refresh here. And so, so the saints had been refreshed through Philemon, and they had gotten rest through them. Philemon had been spiritually refreshed by Christ, and then he could refresh others. So that's certainly a task for us also. <clears throat> and then he finishes with the word brother. And in the Greek, if they, the noun comes at the end of the sentence, it's there for emphasis. So again, he's emphasizing to Philemon this idea that Timothy's a brother, Paul's a brother, Philemon's a brother, and then we're going to see where Onesimus is now a brother. So, so he's working up to what he wants to talk to him about. So now we're ready for verse 8. Uh, I thought this was kind of an interesting 
way of going about this. He said, therefore, I have enough confidence in Christ to order you to do what is proper. Okay. Um, so because of Philemon's character, Paul's got a request that he wants to bring to Philemon. Now, we know what their request is. Philemon don't yet in this letter. But he starts off, he says, I have enough confidence and the word here for confidence is a word that's also translated boldness, but it carries with us this, this idea of authority. Paul has an apostolic authority. He could have told Philemon what to do with Onesimus. He could have commanded him to do that, but he's going to tell him, I don't want to, I don't want to do that. I want you to decide this on your own. Like he's trusting Philemon to make the right choice about Onesimus. But what he's saying is, I have enough authority in Christ to order you to do that which is proper. Now, this Naufel Staten wrote a little bit about this idea that um, the Greek word for proper means what is ethic ethically suitable or something that fulfills a moral obligation, okay? And so this fitting thing, this proper thing that Paul wants Philemon to do is to accept an act as a Christian brothers and not as a slave. And we'll, we'll get into this here in a little bit. Now, Paul has no doubt about what the right thing to do is, okay? What the proper thing to do is. But it's not that easy for Philemon to see what is right. You know, he had lost one slave. If he take that slave back without punishment, then other slaves might be encouraged to run away. So, Naufel Staten wrote, says, How often does one's selfish interest cloud one's perception of right and wrong? And we all struggle with that. If you have a dog in the fight, so to speak, you think of it in a different way than somebody who don't. It's harder for you to see what's really right and wrong when you're totally involved in the situation. Another um, saying like that is someone will say from the outside looking in. If you're not personally involved, it's easier to see what is right and what is wrong. But if you have a stake in it, we are all have our uh, thought processes clouded by that. And so we need to be on the guard for that, that we don't allow how it's going to affect us personally when we're trying to make decisions about what is proper, okay, what is right. So it was an interesting uh, little sideline there. So, he says, I, I have enough confidence in Christ in order to do, to, in, in Christ to order you to do that which is proper. Yet, verse 9, yet for love's sake, I would rather appeal to you, since I am such a person as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Let's look at the first phrase there says, yet for love's sake, I would rather appeal to you. Okay, he could have commanded Philemon on what to do, but he wanted him to have the opportunity to act as love would lead him to act. Okay, now Paul was, he knew what was right, and he knew what he wanted Philemon to do, but he wanted Philemon to make that choice on his own. Now, I, I have to chuckle because Paul is like playing on, Philemon's emotions here, tugging at his heartstrings. <laughs> and it's like, almost like, won't you do this for me since I am such a person as Paul, okay, the aged. Here I am. I'm an old man. You could do this as a favor to me. And don't forget, I'm also a prisoner here for Christ Jesus. So he, he's really playing on Philemon's emotions. I, it's really a, such a personal uh, view into Paul's mind here. Uh, we don't see this a lot in Scripture, 
But, but Paul is, is just saying, hey, don't forget, man, I, I'm really old. And Paul was probably in his mid-60s now. So he, he was getting up there in years. Uh, so he um, says, don't forget that I'm aged and also a prisoner of Christ. Now, verse 10, he says, and I appeal to you for my child. Okay? Um, so... He is Paul's, Onesimus is Paul's child because he begat him, or he, it was through him that he became a Christian. So um, he says, whom I have begotten in my imprisonment. So somehow Onesimus met Paul while he was in prison here, and he became a Christian. And Paul gave him the information, he taught him what he needed to know for him to make that decision. Um, and so then he finally, he names him. Uh, I appeal to you for my child whom I have begotten in my imprisonment, Onesimus. Now, we don't know if Philemon probably maybe had no idea where Onesimus went. And here it is. Paul saying, hey, Onesimus is with me. Not only is he with me, he has become a Christian uh, with me, while I've been in prison here. And he goes on. And uh, talks about it here in verse 11, who formerly was useless to you, but now is useful to both you and to me. Now, we don't know much about Onesimus, only what we see here in this letter. And he is mentioned in the book of Colossians, which we're going to do next also. Um, but uh, he says, who formerly was useless to you. Um, it's sort of a play on words here. Anisimus means, his word means useful, okay, or profitable. Now, there was a name that was common to give to slaves. Uh, so, by calling him Anisimus, it means he was useful, he was profitable. Now, Paul uses this sort of a play on words he says he was formerly useless to you because he ran away okay he wasn't living up to his name but now is useful both to you and me okay he hadn't lived up his name earlier he wasn't profitable philemon then but it's changed since he became a christian now indicates since he's become a christian since he's been with paul he's been very profitable to paul um and he was very much ministers to Paul. We'll see that here in just a little bit as a, while he was a prisoner. So, he continued then here and he says, I've sent him back to you in person. Now, the Greek word for sent back here is a word that's technically used in in court cases and referring someone to a higher court. And so Paul is, in this case, turning over uh, the case to Philemon for a verdict is really what he's getting at here. Now, I want to take just a second and say, I think something should be said here about the faith of An Anisimus. Um, he's done something quite, quite courageous by returning to Philemon. Uh, something that demonstrates his, the sincerity of his commitment to Christ. Onesimus could have remained a fugitive, but he chose to return instead. I mean, Paul is sending him back, but Paul's in no position to force him, okay, to return. Paul is chained to a soldier in Rome. Uh, once Onesimus is out of his sight, he could go wherever he wanted. So while Paul has urged him, it's really is a voluntary act on the part of Onesimus that he's going back. So, and so he finishes here, he says that I have sent him back to you in person, that is sending my very heart. He's just trying to emphasize how important uh, Onesimus is to Paul and how supportive he has been. And he says this in verse 13. He says, whom I wish to keep with me. And the word wished here is in the imperfect tense, 
which means he kept wishing. He was wishing that he really would rather that Onesimus stayed with him. But he knew it was important and it was the right thing to do to, for Onesimus to go back to Philemon. And he said, I was wishing to keep him with me that in your behalf he might minister to me in my imprisonment for the gospel. And so that's what he had been doing. He had been ministering to Paul. He had been taking care of him. And Paul wished he had kept him, but he knew the right thing to do was for him to go back. Um, let's do one more verse here. It says, but uh, without your consent, I did not want to do anything, uh, that your goodness should not be, as it were, by compulsion, but of your own free will. So, Although Paul thought about keeping Onesimus here in Rome, uh, he, I think Paul really had faith that uh, Philemon was going to do the right thing. And he didn't want to keep him there without Philemon's consent. And so he didn't want to do that. Um, he says he didn't want Philemon's goodness to be, as it were, by compulsion. Um, they say a gift given out of necessity is no gift at all. Okay, and that follows the same line here. Paul wanted Philemon to have the opportunity of his own free will to, I think Paul's really asking Philemon, like, hey, if you really don't need Onesimus, you can send him back to me. Paul really uh, used his, the ministering of Onesimus, and he really counted on it, and he wished he was there. But he knew the right thing was to send him back. And he's almost kind of underlying here, reading between the lines, like if, if you really want to send him back, that'd be okay. But it needs to be on your free will. All right, we're going to stop there, verse 15. And we will start there <clears throat> next week. So as always, um, look out for one another. Uh, always be on the lookout for what you can do for to be a servant of the Lord. Uh, be kind, be compassionate. Uh, if you see a need that you need help with, uh, let us know. Uh, we can help you. And Lord willing, uh, we will meet you again right here next week. God bless.